So you're in Erie, Pennsylvania, minding your own business one day, and what happened? <laughs> I got a phone call on Wednesday from Coach Gundy. And Coach Clements and I had spoken about coming down here at some point and, and talking ball again because I knew Coach Clements and I've followed him and have stayed in, in contact with him. But got a phone call from Coach Gundy, and about 10 days later, everything happened. So did, were you able to come out in advance uh, of accepting the job and, and do anything really intentional, or was it pretty much all just long distance? It wasn't all long distance. I was able to come out and, and meet him and meet some of the guys on the staff. I, I never actually came to Stillwater, but I'd been here before, so that didn't matter. And I got a chance to, to talk ball and go through what I do and really get to meet everybody. Is it one of those phone calls that when you hang up, you're sort of like, did that just happen? Or was it more like, I was expecting this? I'd be lying if I told you I was <laughs> expecting it. We were in a recruiting meeting. We were talking about the official visit we were about to have. And a call from Stillwater, Oklahoma comes up. And you go out and you talk to him. And it was, I remember talking to Coach Rayburn saying, Coach Gundy just called me. He wants to talk football with me. He's interested in our defense and what we do. It wasn't... Uh, wasn't expected at all. What was your impression of Oklahoma State before you got here? That it was one of the top jobs in the country at any conference. I think the reputation of this place speaks for itself. And when we did come in here, I know the quote up on the walls is, you know, we built the best so that we can be the best. And the expectations are clear. It's an unbelievable facility. It's got tradition. It's got a head coach that's been here that has passion about this place. I think it's one of the best jobs in the country. Coach, when anybody does any research on you, one thing that comes up repeatedly is your relationship with your student athletes um, in a good way, of mm -hmm. course. So is that by design or is that just because you're so likable that people just can't stand but to, can't help but not like you? <laughs> I'd love to say it's because they just love me. They can't help it, but it's, it's intentional. It's, it's Coach Higgins and Coach Solich. Those two, even, even Coach Brown at, at Missouri S&T, everything we ever did was about loving our players. I think back, you asked me about if someone ever said anything that, mm -hmm. that influenced me. I remember my first job at s and we're sitting around and Coach Brown asks, you know, why do you guys want to do it? What's your goals? And you got to think, you're in a room of everyone's 24, 25, 26. How many people are saying, I want to coach at this school. I want to coach here. I want to do that. And David asked us, is it ever about the players? Because if it's not about the players, why are you doing it? And with a very straight face, not being stern, not being anything, said, if you're not in this for the players, get out. And that stuck with me. And then I go to Emporia, and Coach Higgins is, he's unapologetically himself. He doesn't care. He loves his players. He tells them he loves them. He holds them accountable. He coaches them hard. He always says, it's just his tone. You know, I'm not mad at you. It's just my tone. His players know he loves them. So I watched that firsthand, and you just can't help but adapt to it and want to be that way. So I never wanted my players to ever feel like they couldn't call me. I never wanted my players to feel like they didn't enjoy being around me. So it was intentional to make sure they knew I cared about them. I can hold you accountable. I can tell you I love you and still force you to be the best version of yourself every day. It's not soft. It's not people mistake kindness for weakness. That's the farthest thing from the truth. What does success look like for you as a coach? Success as a coach means that in 15 years, I'm still getting phone calls from players. It means I'm getting invitations to weddings. It means I get a text message, coach, I just became a dad. One of the best moments of my life, and he's not a player anymore, so I can actually say this. Cade Harrelson is from Davenport, Oklahoma. He pl I recruited him to Emporia State. He graduated from Emporia State. He's done playing. Cade called me before he proposed. To Tori, his girlfriend, now, uh, now wife, and he wanted to call me and tell me before it went public. I remember where I was, I remember what I was doing, and I remember hanging up the phone saying, that's pretty cool. And I actually spoke to Cade today. He's, his mom reached out to me because of the relationship I had with that family. So I hope I get phone calls and text messages and letters or whatever from every player 15 years down the road, 30 years down the road. I'm going to coach until I'm dead. I don't, I don't have any hobbies. I don't know what else I would do. But man, those 
570 text messages. That's how many text messages I got the night I got this job. And I would say 300 of them were former players. That was pretty cool. I remember we held the announcement until you could tell your current team. Yes. Yeah, that was, it was announced at one. I had them all in the room so that when it hit social media, I could come in and not tell them before it hit. And the, I had one-on-one -on -one meetings with a few of them and they clapped. They teared up. They were happy for me because they all knew what this opportunity meant for me, what it meant for my family. They knew I didn't want to leave Gannon and I, I didn't want to leave Gannon. I'm not going to, I loved it there. I loved Coach Rayburn. I loved Lisa, our athletic director. I loved Erie. But this is obviously an unbelievable opportunity and something that I'm excited about. But to see their reactions and see how genuinely happy they were for me showed me that everything I thought about that place was right. It's not about where you go, it's about who you're with. And if you're around good people, you can make any place special. And if you're around bad people, a great place can become very miserable. With so many new faces and you being new, how does everybody gel into one unit? And I know you've got a lot of time before we kick mm -hmm. off, but a lot of transitions have been going on. Mm -hmm. The number one way to have buy-in is to have people believe. And they believe if they know you care about them. It goes back to relationships. It goes back to being prepared and not being afraid to say, I don't know, I'll find the answer, I'll figure it out, whatever. You know, being a real genuine person. And when we talk about how to get a kid to believe, you just have to be able to give them an answer and teach them why. Kids nowadays, and anyone nowadays, they don't want to do stuff just because you tell them. They want to know why. They want to know how it can impact them in a positive way. People misconstrue that for kids are selfish, they're looking out for themselves. No, they're not. They just want to know why they're doing things so they can have fun with it and they can embrace it and make it their own. Everyone wants ownership. Everyone wants to be great. And if you give them ownership and you say, hey, this is why, then it's easy to get a buy-in from a kid. If you don't make them think they have to do th something, you make it feel like it's something they get to do, right? I don't have to go to work every day. I get to go to work. You don't have to come to football practice. You get to go to football practice. You get to be around this program. I told them one of the first things I said is how lucky they are. You guys are playing college football and not because you're playing college football at Oklahoma State, but because you're playing college football, you're still playing a game. You're still doing something that everyone wishes they could do. And it doesn't matter if you're at Gannon, it doesn't matter if you're at Oklahoma State, you're still playing football. And I've coached in front of 100 people, I've coached in front of 100,000 people when I was a grad assistant at Ohio. Game day is game day. Yes, the atmosphere is different. Yes, the players are bigger, stronger, and faster. Yes, things are gonna go good, bad, whatever, but it's still ball and it's still going to be an unbelievable experience for the players while they're here, and you still treat them exactly the same way regardless. What can fans expect from your defense? Runners and hitters. We try to keep it simple. We try to let the kids play fast, but every time we've ever described this defense, it's runners and hitters. How can we get kids to believe in what they're doing, run really fast, hit really hard, and be confident in what they do. Will you come in and watch every snap of every game from last year or will you start from scratch? A little bit of both. Mm -hmm. I'm going to watch film and see who can move and who can do what. I'm not going to judge them off what they did last year. I think that's unfair. Not because of what they were doing, not be because I don't know what they were being coached to do. Even if the coaches here can tell me, it's still, I didn't firsthand experience it. So I think that's unfair to judge players off that. Now, if they've had success, you're going to know they're probably a good football player. But if someone struggles, why am I going to have some preconceived notion about them and think negatively about them? I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to show me how good they can be. On game days, you uh, in the press box or are you on the field? In the box. Have you ever heard the name Mike Yersich? I have. Has that come up more recently? Uh, a little bit more, but I knew of him when he got this job because, I was again, I was in Emporia when he got – hired here and we all do it and said man a guy from the PSAC ends up going from Shippensburg to Oklahoma State that's unbelievable good for him that's he must be a heck of a football coach and uh, when I get up to Erie I learn that he actually spent some time at Mount Union which coach Rayburn is a Mount Union guy mm -hmm. so coach Rayburn knows him and we had talked about it a few times now he's at Penn State so that name came up a little bit and then when I get this job everyone's making the comparison and that's not even 
I mean, can't compare me to how much success he's had and what he's done. I hope I have a fraction of his success. But the people have talked about him a little bit to me. Talk about transitioning from uh, Division Two, whether it be Emporia or Gannon, to not just Division One, but the Power Five level. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a big adjustment. It's going to be recruiting different. You're recruiting different kinds of players. There's different things involved that I've never dealt with before. But I've always lived by the idea that I'm never going to get outworked. And effort's going to solve a lot of things. It's no different than what we tell a player on defense. Yes, we're going to run this scheme or this call, and maybe there's something the offense can do versus this particular call that's a weakness, right? We call this defense, they run an RPO. Oh, darn, they got us. Great call. Effort solves a lot of problems. And I know there's going to be things I'm going to need to learn. I know there's going to be adjustments I'm going to have to make. And I know, I don't know everything, but I didn't know everything when I was getting hired at Emporia State. I didn't know everything, anything when I got to Gannon. I always had to adjust. And what's going to get me through that is I will never get outworked. And I'll try to find a way to continue to hold that mentality. Effort will solve a lot of problems, whether it's on the field or whether it's with me. When you're not completely overhauling your defensive identity, what do you do to relax? Spend time with my family. I love my boys. I've, I've got two little boys. I've got an amazing wife. I love to work on my yard. Uh, that's, that's something, when we bought our house in Emporia, I became OCD about how you know, my lawn was going to be. And then it happened in Youngstown, happened in Erie. So work on my yard, be around my boys, and that's it. Love my family. So your hometown is basically less than 4,000 people. And you went to college in Athens, 24,000 or so, mm -hmm. about the same as Emporia, mm -hmm. pretty much. Small town guy or is that just coincidence? Small town guy. Small town guy married to a small town girl. You have two siblings and a dad who are football coaches. How did that uh, get going and how did that propel each of you into the profession? Well, I mean, it started how it started. My, my father, he would coach us in junior high. He started when I think my older brother was in junior high is when he got involved. He always loved coaching. I think he wanted to pursue it even when he was younger, but he had my older brother when he was 22 and then me shortly after that. So got into newspapers, a little bit more stable of a profession than, than coaching. and Sort of. Yeah, sort of. A little bit, mm -hmm. <laughs> a little bit better and had done really well. Worked in publishing, worked in, uh, as advertising director, publisher, and has worked his way up and has done really well. But always had that passion to be around coaching and around football. So when he got involved with it at the high school level and the junior high level, we were growing up in it. Then by the time I graduated and moved on, he became a varsity offensive coordinator and moved around the different parts of, he coached in Ohio, then went across the river and coached at Bishop Donahue in West Virginia. So you grew up in the best named hometown in North America, Shadyside, <laughs> Ohio. That, that sounds like the perfect place on the Ohio River. So you were surrounded by West Virginia Mountaineers, Buckeyes, Steelers, Browns. Who did you guys root for? We grew up Notre Dame fans. Notre Dame so fans. my entire family's Catholic. And my mom's side, my dad's side, Notre Dame fans through and through. And my, my high school was St. John Central fighting Irish. So oh, wow. our fight song was the same fight song. It was, that's what we grew up rooting for. So you were four years as, a, as an undergrad, you were a student coach. Mm -hmm. So how does one become a student coach? And I know your brother also had that same gig as an undergrad, right? Yes. So my, my mother actually got us involved in that. So Chad Brinker is from Martins Ferry, which is right by where I grew up. Chad was a running back at Ohio U. His mother and my mother grew up together. Matt wanted to get into coaching. So he, my mother talked to Chad's mother. They went through the whole process and she goes, he should go volunteer and be a student coach. So she likes to brag that she got us involved <laughs> in it. So when I was a freshman, I knew I wanted to stay around athletics. I thought I was gonna be a journalist at first and follow my dad's path. So I went down to Ohio U with him for August fall camp and basically just said, I'll film. I'll do whatever I need to do, I'll volunteer. So he got me in the door and volunteered every day since. So you were there for one year and then there was a coaching change mm -hmm. and Frank Solich comes in after one year out of coaching, after being at Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Did you have to resell yourself uh, to him to keep your position? Uh, <clears throat> not so much to Coach Solich, but to Jason Grooms. Jason Grooms was the Director of Football Operations and when he, when that whole staff came in, it was over Christmas break, so we showed up in January and whole new staff, all the people we know is gone, and I just 
went back up, knocked on his door and said, hey, I'd love to help. I want to continue to be involved. And Jason actually was a student assistant at Ohio U during his undergrad. Went on to be a grad assistant at Wake Forest, coached at Elon, and then ended up coming back with Coach Solich to be the DFO. So he was pretty partial to student assistants and wanted, I don't, I don't think anyone says no to free help anymore. So. so you ended up working for Frank Solich for five years, counting your years as a GA. Does that sound uh, right? It was three years as a, so six total. Six total. Three years as a student assistant and three years as a grad assistant. So what kind of influence on you has he been? <laughs> Unbelievable. He was a sounding board in a lot of things. He's always and continued to be a mentor. I got off, this job got announced at one o'clock Eastern time. By 1.15, I had a phone call from Coach Solich, which just blew me away. And I've had good moments in this profession. I've had bad moments in this profession. And Coach Solich has always been a phone call away. He's always been a mentor. He's helped me in more ways than I can even think about from how to recruit, how to care about players, how to be a good man. He's a big reason that I am where I am. Now, who are your other influences coaching wise or maybe just life philosophies? Uh, Jimmy Burrow uh, was our defensive coordinator and I student coached for him. I GA'd for him. Jimmy treated me like a son. I, our grad assistants, if I'll ask him to do something, maybe I, like, I was treated really well as a grad assistant mm -hmm. from, from Coach Burrow and everybody on that staff. But learned how to treat GAs, learned how to work hard, learned how to be organized, and Jimmy's the same way. Coach Burrow, I owe him everything. And he has a fairly famous son now. Yeah, he's okay. Yeah. He, you know, I think most people have heard of him. Uh, so, another one would be Ross Ells. Ross Ells was the linebacker's coach the whole time I was there. He's now the linebacker's coach at Michigan State. And then I would say David Brown at Missouri S&T, Garen Higgins at Emporia State. He shaped me into the coach I am with how to recruit, how to build relationships, how to never settle. I owe everything to Coach Higgins with how to – I grew as a coach in eight years with him. And then Coach Rayburn at Gannon gave me an opportunity to be a coordinator again, let me run my stuff and believed in me, and I owe him a lot. Did any of them ever just say something that rang true to you and you're like, okay, this is what I'm going to hang my hat on as a, as a coach? David Brown told me if a kid can't spell cat and you yell at him, he still can't spell cat. So you better learn how to be a good teacher. He wasn't a yeller. He wasn't a cusser. So I developed a lot of that from him. I remember getting mad. It was my first job. So everyone gets mad during that. Why is he not doing this? And David goes, you better teach him. If he doesn't know what to do, you have to look in the mirror and make sure you're teaching it the right way. Interesting. So as a GA at Ohio, you're on the defensive side of the ball. Did you pick defense or did defense pick you? Defense picked me. Jamar Kane was the grad assistant. He's actually now the line, uh, defensive line coach at LSU. Jamar was the GA. I met with him. We were, we were driving over to Walmart or something. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I think I want to coach. He goes, cool, you're my student assistant. You're coming <laughs> with us. And that day I was with the corners with, with Fred Reed. So a career pivot right there, yeah. a fork in the road right there. Yep, yep, he didn't give me a choice. You're going to help me. So talk about, uh, Coach, how you wound up at Emporia State. Tim Albin is the offensive coordinator, or sorry, he was the offensive coordinator. Now he's the head coach at Ohio. His best friend is Garen Higgins. They coached together at Northwestern and Alva. Mm -hmm. Won a national championship there together. Coach Higgins was, became the head coach at Emporia State. And I remember I was, a, I was substitute teaching in Rolla, Missouri to make extra money. And I got a phone call from Coach Albin saying, Emporia State needs a linebackers coach, possibly a coordinator. Are you interested? I said, absolutely, I would be. He said, head coach will call you in two hours. That night, I had a phone call with Coach Higgins. I give him a hard time because he, he drove me out there to interview. I think he offered it to like three other guys. And then he got stuck with me. So it worked out well. But I ended up there because of Coach Albin. Talk about the success that you guys had at Emporia State because it was rather historic. It was great. It was, we had great kids. We had an unbelievable culture. I got there at the right time. So Coach Higgins had it trending up. He had been there for five years, going on year six. They hadn't had a winning season yet, but they were, everything was going in the right direction. I think it was two and nine, three and eight, three and eight, five and six, five and six, but the five and six was a, had won four, their last four. And when he interviewed me and he brought me in, he goes, Brian, we got all the pieces. We got everything we need to be great. And the quarterback was unbelievable. The kids were unbelievable. They wanted to be great. And uh, by the time the season started, I became the play caller. And we went 10-2. and two. 
that started everything. And the next year we went nine and two. We had three trips to the NCAA playoffs. We had 63 wins, which I think was the most in any 10 year span of Emporia State. And we did it in eight years. Won the only playoff game in school history, hosted a playoff game and won that one. It was unbelievable. And it was all because of Coach Higgins and the culture he built. So at one point while you're at Emporia State, you're the defensive coordinator. Your brother, Matt, is the offensive coordinator. Now we've been looking, we can't find where that's ever happened before <laughs> in NCAA history now. I'm not saying that's totally researched, mm -hmm. but we've spent some time on it. We can't find it, primarily because it seems that usually coaching families wind up on the same side of the ball. Mm -hmm. Watson and Mac Brown are offense, the Gundys are offense, Rex and Rob Ryan are defense, but how did you guys wind up on different sides of the ball? I don't know. Uh, I always loved defense, even as a player. Matt, he, he's coached on defense before. He coached defense at Muskingum in his first job. He ended up being a head coach at a high school in Florida, and I think that's probably where he transitioned back to offense and likes to score points and likes to have the pen last, so he always wants to tell me what he can do. But uh, he was coaching defensive backs at Pikeville, University of Pikeville, when we had a job open up. The job we had open just happened to be on the offensive side of the ball, and we had had some good years, so Coach Higgins was willing to interview him and hire him. So what were those scrimmages like? <laughs> he cheated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'd be in the box. It was unbel It was so funny. We'd sit right next to each other and call, he'd call plays, I'd call defenses. And I have two headsets on, or two earphones on, so I can't really hear anything. And he'd look over at me and he was like, you, you listened. And I'm like, no, I didn't. <laughs> and like, so I ended up having to go on the field a lot. Uh, during scrimmages just to stay away from him so he couldn't say anything. But it was fun. It was exactly what you would expect it to be. It was fun. We enjoyed it. And you'd have that playful banter back and forth. So things are going really well at Emporia State. Really, really well. Like unprecedented in the history of the school well. But for some reason, you got interested in changing your defensive system. Mm -hmm. What inspired that? 2017, we had to replace nine starters, I think, on defense. And it wasn't just that it was nine starters. It was nine dudes. They were all first-team, all-conference type players. And we stuck with the same defense. We kept doing what we were doing, which was a 4-3, 4-2-5 people. And we were very young. We were very talented, but we were very young. And in that league, you just can't have that room for error. So in 2017, I remember saying a lot, you know, so-and-so is not ready yet. We have to protect him with this coverage. Or, man, they're really exposing this position. We need to make sure we do something different. So I felt like I was constantly making calls to protect position groups, not because they weren't good players. They just weren't ready yet. And we went through that season. We went six and five, but we, were just, we just weren't what we were used to defensively. And we lost a couple games late. It was frustrating. And I sat down with Coach Higgins, and we talked about what we needed to do differently. And we had talked about wanting to go to an odd front. Not necessarily because we didn't have the D linemen, but just because they're so hard to find. So we started studying it. I remember being at my wife's family's house over Christmas, downloading films of people, getting them put up on huddle, breaking them down. How do I run an odd front? How do I fit it up? And we switched to a three down front in 2018 because we just felt like we needed to do something different. If we lined up, the other reason was we couldn't beat Northwest Missouri. Mm -hmm. Even in the years we were good. We were a 4-3, they were a 4-3. We were doing exactly what they were doing, so they knew how to beat it and they had, they had better players. They had really good players at certain spots that we just couldn't cover up. So how do we be different than them in order to separate ourselves defensively, because our offense was always good. We wanted to make sure we separate ourselves defensively. So while you're in Emporia, which is about, I don't know, three hours from Stillwater, three mm -hmm. and a half, did you ever make it down here at all, ever pass through? One time we came here in 2013 to meet with Coach Clements. It was after he had, I think he got here in 13, it was his first year. We came down that spring going into 14 to learn a little bit of what they were doing defensively. I was down here recruiting a few student athletes and would come through here before, but only came in this facility once. What is one thing that uh, the players and staff can expect to hear you say? The one thing they can expect to hear from me is today's the worst we'll ever be. That's something we've 
used throughout my whole life, something I grew up around, something that Coach Mike Rose taught us when we were younger. And I don't know how, I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to find a way tomorrow to be better than we are today.